Thanks, gang. You left a lot on our plate. We appreciate it on this first uh, trading day of the new year. Good to see you, Liz. Good Happy to new see year. you. Yeah, we are waiting on the Fed minutes, but we've got yeah. big breaking news right now. Yeah, indeed, we do. Crude oil gushes to $100 a barrel. It's setting a new trading record. Hi, everybody. I'm David Asman. About a half an hour from the New York close and oil now at $99.35. But earlier this afternoon, we saw it touch $100 a barrel. And all of this is the stock market falling right now by more than 200 points. Mm. The markets are starting the new year much lower. We got some economic data about manufacturing that was very negative. Plus, you see on the screen the biggest story of the day. We've got it all covered for you. Oil charging ahead by $3.44, but it did touch $100 a barrel earlier this afternoon. All right, let's look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which at the moment is trading down about 204 points. Uh, NASDAQ is down as well. Actually, uh, just about exactly Exactly the same percentage-wise, it's down 41 points, but as a percent of the whole, it's down just about the same as the Dow, S&P, Russell. They're all down, but the big story is gold and oil, which are way up. Gold, we haven't talked much about that, is up $21 an ounce, trading right now at about $860 an ounce. Yeah, huge story right now with both gold and oil. A lot of people I've talked to, I got off the phone with Eric Bowling, who was at an airport oh, in Puerto Rico. He has been <laughs> bullish on metals. What a time metals. to take a vacation. <laughs> Very bullish on metals. And, of course, being an oil trader, he's watched this story develop over the past year. He told me that this is a weak dollar story. It has absolutely very little to do with any kind of violence in Nigeria there. Also ahead, why did the Fed cut interest rates? And might those rates be trimmed again? The Fed about to release those minutes from its last meeting. That could add a whole different component into the market. Indeed, today. it could. It could give us some details about what inflation is really doing. Of course, inflation fears, in addition to manufacturing being down, that same indice suggests Suggested that inflation might be up, stagflation. It's a, it's a pale comparison to what happened in the 70s. But again, whenever you have higher inflation and lower production, it's a problem. First, let's get to our top story: oil prices reaching, touching that hundred dollar a barrel milestone. There were about five trades that did so before pulling back. In less than 30 minutes from the close, oil right now is trading higher once again by more than three dollars. It's a big story. The White House is using the occasion to call for increased domestic oil production. Is this the time? for example, to open up that Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for drilling. Let's ask our Fox panel oil traders, Phil Flynn from Aleron Trading and Kevin Kerr of Kerr Trading International. Also joining us, Mike Norman from the Economic Contrarian Update, Tom Atkins from Remax Fairlawn, and Peter Schiff, author of the bestseller Crash Proof. I assume it's a bestseller by now. We've been <laughs> touting it enough. Good to see you all. Uh, let's go first to Phil Flynn, if we may. Now, Phil, We've, been, we've heard before that it might push above 100. If it does so, it'll settle up there a little and then come back down again. Is that your belief? It is my belief. In fact, I think I call it the five lot that was heard around the world because, you know, <laughs> if you look at where all the volume was, I mean, you know, if the electronic trading, we never actually hit $100 a barrel. You know, it was about 40 points away. You know, I don't think we would have actually traded $100 if it wasn't for light volume. And, and I'm looking at the floor trading almost as a secondary market because there was little or no paper in that pit. That's what drove it to $100 a barrel. On the Let me just stop trade, you, Phil. What do you mean when you say yeah. little or no paper in the pit? Well, what happens on a light volume day when a lot of the traders aren't there, there's no buyers or sellers to, to stop a market move. So if all of a sudden somebody comes in and starts buying the market, it drives up the prices until somebody sells it. Now, in the electronic market, where there was a lot of active traders, we hit a certain price level at 99.60, and the sellers came in and sold it and pushed it back down. In the electronic market, because everybody was at home on holiday, still trying to get over their New Year's hangovers, I guess, uh, you know, uh, th there was nobody to step in and to sell okay. it until we hit that psychological number of 100. Gotcha. Kevin Kerr, yeah. you've been talking to your trader friends on the phone this afternoon from the floor. What are they saying and what do you predict is now going to happen with the price? Well, Phil's hit it on the head. You know, we have the electronic market, we have the pit traded market, and the pit trade now seems to be thinner than the electronic. It used to be the opposite. We saw thinner trade in electronic and higher volume in the pit, but it switched around. So I agree, although we did trade $100 and on very light volume, I did confirm that with the floor, that price is going to hold. I think 
think we'll actually see that price carry over into the overnight market. We will see a trade in electronic, probably head higher, maybe 105, 110 even, before we see it back off. I think this is a dollar weakness story, though, like Eric Bowen said. Mike, you've talked, speaking of Eric, we should talk about somebody who's not here, but you talked about the effect that traders have on this market beyond the effect that OPEC has, that the big yeah. oil companies have. Explain. First, I want to give a shout out to my buddy Phil Flynn. Phil, how you doing? He's the hey, best. Hey, Michael, how you doing, buddy? All right, and let me just say, if there's one guy who, throughout all of this, going back for five, four or five years, mm -hmm. who has been correct consistently on oil, it's been Phil. And now that what, he's sort what, of, what about you know, me? <laughs> who was that? Peter. What, what Peter, about me, Mike? Peter, Peter I'll, I'll get to you. Hey, Peter, good seeing you again. Go. Did you have a good vacation? <laughs> good seeing you again. <laughs> Anyway, Phil uh, was the guy. Now that he's a little bit hesitant right here, I think we mm -hmm. ought to pay attention to that. And it's true. There's not a lot of volume. Look, bowling's away in Puerto Rico, right? So, he's I mean, coming a lot back of tomorrow. He'll be here tomorrow. It might get above it for a while, but I think there's going to be some caution coming into the market here. Tom, what do you make of yeah, all we, of this? We, we talk about these prices in a very minute-by-minute-by-minute minute by minute thing, but in the big picture... Oil's going to go up. Why? Because the world economy is going crazy right now. Uh, we're, we're growing at 5 or 6% every year. Uh, and along with that, you have uh, the Federal Reserve just made a gargantuan mistake by raising rates too much too fast and now bringing it back down again. That's why you have a weak dollar. Uh, and also you have all the economies across the world that are growing. And that's another reason why, in relation to their currencies, we have a weaker dollar. Because their, their economies are, are starting to grow. I mean, the China and India story is fabulous. And Europe, I mean, God bless them. I mean, they, they're, they're still halfway socialist. But they're halfway. They used to be completely socialist. Now they're getting a little bit back towards capitalism. And, and, and that makes our currency a little stronger. Peter, I'm going to throw you a question that you're going to love. Uh, one trader that we've heard a lot of, Fidel Gates, said you can't expect oil producers to increase production, which would lower the cost a little bit, when we keep giving them currency that isn't worth as much. Well, Do you that, agree? That's the problem. The problem is we're producing too much money, not producing too, few, too little oil. You know, this is an inflation story. Oil prices are dri being driven up by inflation. And we don't have stagflation light, like you alluded to. This is stagflation heavy. This is worse than the 1970s. And you know, the news that we got today on manufacturing, the fact that manufacturing right. in the United States is at a five-year low right now, blows apart the whole thesis. But is the answer, Peter, is the answer to drill mm -hmm. domestically in Anwar the, and some the, of the other areas? The answer is to stop printing money. The answer is to stop creating inflation, raise interest rates, and, and, and have a sensible monetary policy. Well, you, you don't want to create an economic depression to try to bring oil prices down, but no, no. There is a grain of truth no. in what Peter is saying. There's, more, there's just, a whole Sahara If I could just desert. translate. <laughs> by, by, with the dollar going down, and it's not necessarily as a result of the Fed's policy, but with the dollar going down, hard assets have become interesting for investors to own. You asked me about the, the trader element. Let's go larger than that. Institutions, pension funds, endowments, these very large long-term investors who now see commodities as a valid asset class oil being one of them, they're moving into it in a big way. They have hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars to move in this direction. Exactly. And they're doing it. And we created those dollars out of thin air. That's the problem. If we had legitimate economic growth, well, we prices would be going down. Growth. No, we yeah. don't, Mike. We've never had a legitimate economic uh, growth. Uh, uh, I'll I, think, I think the dollar weakness is a big part of the story. Inflation is part of it. But also, we do need to look at these alternatives. We need to look at alternative energy seriously, not just ethanol from corn. These new mandates in corn ethanol make me very frightened. We should be looking at bio fuel from other sources. We should be looking at offshore drilling, nuclear, all of it. We need to. That's going to help supplement whatever. When the dollar does pick up again, why do these it's federal mandates it's not, make that's you not happen. The federal mandates make me worry because corn-based ethanol is not a clear, a clear answer. Obviously, there's concerns about it. It's not the answer. I keep listening to the guy, to everybody here, and it sounds like the, the, you know, the five blind men in the elephant. You know, everybody grabs a different part of the elephant and tells you what it looks like. It's really all of them. So it's all that stuff together. I mean, whether, it's the, whether it's the Fed mistakes, whether it's the other economies getting stronger or not, whether it's you know, not producing here in the, in the States, you know, they all kind of add up. So you, that's why you're seeing this perfect story. Storm of, of a little bit of a mess here. Phil Flynn, what happens tomorrow? Uh, Phil? I think we I think we start coming back down. We may spike above 100 on the overnight, but we're getting close. Bottom line is, in the month of November, the world produced more oil than it right. ever did before. We're going to see more oil production. In 2008, the demand growth picture does not look as strong as it has in years past. You know, I don't care about Nigeria right now. It's a concern or Pakistan that doesn't produce any oil. But, you know, the geopolitical outlook looks a lot yeah. less risky going into 2008 than yeah. it did 2000. And that's a good, say that's a good point though. to end this particular <laughs> discussion, Liz. Stock investors.
breaking news, some fresh insight at this hour as to what the Fed's decision was to cut rates a quarter point last month. Our Rich Edson has been looking over the minutes from the meeting just made public, and he joins us now with details. Hi, Rich. Hey, David and Liz, and to be honest with you, you know, you really hit the nail on the head when you said the credit crunch uh, more so than inflation was the real concern when we read over the minutes there. And, and let's just take a look at the big concerns here, why they cut uh, a quarter point when they did. Uh, consumption growth has slowed in the fourth quarter. They're projecting slowing employment gains. Uh, real consumer spending was flat. Those were the big big concerns here, of course, outweighing inflation. What they said was the upside risk to inflation really balances out uh, the risks that have been posed to growth. The fourth quarter uh, was a little bit more, they're expecting the fourth quarter to be a little bit more downbeat than they had originally uh, projected. Uh, the, they're marking down their real GDP numbers for the fourth quarter, but they're saying core inflation was projected to hold steady in 2008, and I think that's really what you have to look at these numbers and say, you know, you're always balancing out inflation concerns. You're always looking at con inflation when you're talking about market rate cuts. And th what they've decided to do here is, is look and say, all right, we're going to keep an eye on inflation. But right now, it, it looks like it may hold steady in 2008. And they, another uh, few points that they said the growth would recover as the housing market recover. Uh, and then you may look to see some easing uh, a stance on a monetary policy. You heard Sandra Smith mention that earlier before. And members recognize markets may improve with a reversal of some rate cuts. So if you see some improvement, the, it, what this basically really means is that they're going to keep their eye on the economy. This is a very mixed bag here. Uh, they're poised, they're ready to make a move on something, but they're, it's such a volatile economy right now. Uh, they're not overly pessimistic, but uh, again, they're not overly optimistic either. Back to you. All right, Rich, thanks very much. Well, looking over these latest minutes and considering everything that's happened with the market since that meeting, the question is, did the Fed get it right or wrong with a cut? Let's ask our Fox panel. Peter Schiff, I'm going to let you take first crack because you have very uh, emotional points of view on this issue, but did the Fed get it wrong? Well, the Fed always gets it wrong. And my points of view are not necessarily emotional. They're intellectual, and, and they've been right. <laughs> but the well, problem is, Peter, you are just bad. Let's just get it out in the open. Peter is perfect. But the, the problem is, you know, first of all, with inflation, all the Fed is trying to do is influence expectations, which they somehow believe uh, consumer prices are a function of expectations. They're not. But they're basically lying about inflation. The Fed knows inflation is a huge problem. Gold wouldn't be up $25 an hour today. Oil wouldn't be up the way it is. Soybeans wouldn't be almost in the teens right now if the Fed wasn't creating a tremendous amount of inflation. That's what's going on. And so they're underestimating the inflation problem deliberately. And the economy is far weaker than what the Fed lets on. We are in serious, serious trouble. Well, based on what, and Peter? You keep, saying, Peter, you keep saying that the growth is not real. I want you to come out with some piece of data, some evidence that the growth is not real. You because, keep reiterating this because I, with no basis in no. fact whatsoever. Tell me, give me one you know, well, example of how growth is not real. Because all our growth is being measured by consumption. Our GDP is better than 70% consumption. We're borrowing money from our creditors to buy products Peter. that they made. Uh, uh, the on, the economy is shrinking. Oh, yeah. Tom, Tom Mike, if you knew this, Tom Atkins, go ahead. How else are you going to measure it? That's the courses by what we buy. So, how do you measure? How else do you measure? I've never heard Peter, Tom I've never lost heard Peter, Peter, the ability of an individual to consume all kinds of things from uh, education, food, clothing, housing, health care, that is a measure of wealth. It is a way to say how wealthy the Kevin poor, poor we're nation is. Excuse We're me, not, Kevin, remember, did you're the, the Fed get it right? I don't know if my comments are intellectual, but they're factual. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, That's look, not allowed here. Looking back, I think you know it's easy to say 2020 is hindsight. You know, and the bottom line, the Fed did what it had to do at the time. Whether it was right or wrong, I think at this point we have to say they did it. We're done. Let's move forward. This is a demand picture. Why are soybeans, gold, oil up? It's demand. It's global demand. It's Maybe. inflation. It's safe, okay. Well, that gold, might be part of it, but you know the bottom same line is it's gold. demand picture. It's the same thing with gold. No. That's why gold's up is because look, if people get worried about anything whatsoever across the whole world. The rest of the rest of the world has more money than they used to have. They're creating wealth all over the place. Do you own so any they gold? Use the same thing. Do you own any? Uh, I do. I, I own a lot I, of it. I, I buy real estate, man. I'm the smartest <laughs> guy here. Well, well, didn't you, you didn't you predict last year on Fox that real estate prices would be ten, would be up ten percent in two thousand and seven? Two years ago. As soon no, as that was one year ago. As soon as the Fed I was on the, the show with you. As soon as the Fed went 
want the five. I said, I said no. The I was on the show with you. Right. Speaking of the Fed, the December market is off 07. its earlier lows since the Fed minutes came out. So the market seemed to like what the Fed is focusing upon at the moment, and that would be worries about the credit crunch. And that seems to indicate, well, that, Mike, uh, that we would see more Fed cuts. Well, we're going to see more Fed cuts, and let's should face it, we? that of course we should. That's the function of a central bank to be a lender of last resort. Look, the the Fed the came into being in 1913 with, with that first you know, screw up, if I could say it, with the depression where they actually tightened monetary policy and exacerbated the depression. They've been doing everything right uh, since no, the Volcker Fed. Right. And, and Peter, just for a second, please. The Fed has provided liquidity. Look, we had the stock market crash in 1987. We had the, the, uh, the, the Russian debt default, long-term capital management, 9-11. Every time the Fed was there to provide liquidity, we've skirted Create recession. Hold on. I think you'd agree that the Fed's got to be careful not to be looking like they're placating to the market. Exactly. And at this point, exactly. they cut further. The, the inflation expectations implied in the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, the TIPS, is 1.9%. I always say on this show, leave it to the marketplace. The marketplace says right now there is no inflation, no, at least on the part of bond Mike, investors. Hold on, Peter. That's because no investors are buying tips. They're not buying treasuries. Those are then speculators the tips, or hedge funds. Hey, hey, the investors are buying gold. If you want to know about inflation protection, look at the price of gold. Forget about these tips. There's no investors in By there. By the way, just so folks bubble. out there know, tips are these inflation index bonds. They're bonds that are indexed to inflation. And no, they're not indexed to inflation. Is a problem. They're indexed to these government bonds. Go They're ahead, indexed Gino. to the CPI, right. not to the inflation. CPI. All right. The CPI, to the CPI, which, to which, which Peter doesn't think is inflation. Look, the, the, no. the, the Fed put themselves in a very tough place because when they raise rates too much too fast, they, they slow the economy down, which has now recovered, but they, but they, but they really crush the real estate market. And the, and the balance here is which way do they go? Do they, do, they, do they tighten and therefore crush the real estate market even further, or do they loosen and therefore risk inflation? The problem is they have to loosen because the real estate market can definitely pull down the, the rest Tom, of the economy. Why do you the believe, rest of the economy cannot single hand single handedly pull down the real estate market. That we've recovered from the weakness that we've seen. You see a three and four percent growth every quarter. No, what? Except for one. What do you mean, what? It was the last quarter? It was four percent growth. Four percent. Yeah, that's because the government assumed inflation was one percent. What? You got to open. The government assumed inflation no, was only one percent. They said it was two point one percent in the no. PC, uh, uh, PCE uh, in, in, index. It was two point one. But it was in, the, in the GDP deflator, it, it went was, up hey, to two point one percent. Let's let's but not get way, so. The, hold on. Let's not get so back bogged down in these in these statistics. The bottom line is that there is a slight uptick, at least according to today's figures. While while manufacturing was down a bit, they down saw a, bit, a, a little a uptick. Low. Hold on, Peter. In in inflation. So is now the time to be cutting rates when you see an uptick in inflation? No, I think we have to be very careful about inflation. And look at the commodities across the board. We're seeing prices climb. We had oil up 60% last year. I don't think the Fed can ignore there is inflation in the With the exception of oil, some of these commodity prices will be self-correcting. You'll plant okay. more corn. You'll plant more wheat. And it'll Last be word from Mr. Norman. A new year, a new chief executive. That is definitely the big story of the day. And I wanted to bring up the XOI. This is the Amex Oil and Gas Index. And it is higher by about a third of a percent, a little over a third of a percent. But what this is, it's a basket of stocks of all the biggest oil names like BP and ConocoPhillips, Chevron's in there, Hess, Marathon Oil, Occidental. So the biggest names, including some European names like Repsol and Total, ExxonMobil's in there. And this gives us an indication that it has been certainly a big bullish day for it many It has. Business. Of course, you wonder what happens to some of these stocks if oil does come down. Yeah. Even some of the folks who said it was going to go up above 100 said it might settle there for a while and then drop down to lows that we haven't seen in quite some time. If that happens, what happens to the stocks? Well, will the high prices for oil speed bump the American consumer and the economy? Let's bring our Fox panel back to talk about it, including Phil Flynn, who is back from Aleron Trading. Phil, what effect will these oil prices have on the consumer? I think that we're going to see an immediate price shock. Whenever prices go up fast, you know, consumers always take a step back. And, and in this time, we have seen uh, oil prices go up with unprecedented speed. But because we've had a strong economy over the last few years, people then adjust to these prices and go back to their normal spending habits. So it may not have a big impact 
on the consumer if the economy stays strong. But if the jobs market starts to weaken a little bit, you bet your bottom dollar that they'll have an impact on consumer spending and prices will come down. So keep an eye on the jobs number. That'll probably tell you more oh, than yeah. the price of a barrel of oil. Tom, I'm looking at the markets now. Dow is down about 205 points. Yes, the ISM manufacturing index report, which came in, look, no way to no way to describe it except but negative because now we see contraction had something to do with that but oil doesn't help at these prices does that then put a stop sign right in front of the u.s. consumer uh... it puts a slow sign uh... they're not going to stop but they're definitely going to slow down and, and that presents a great buying opportunity for all the stocks to get hammered temporarily by by people who who, who, who think the shock and go <laughs> And then, like, five, six, seven months later, they realize, oh, I got the money. I got the ka-ching. I got, look, honey, we have $15,000 in the bank. We expect they're going to have. Also, they start spending it again. I like that yeah. hyperventilation. That's what they do. Right. How, do how will they describe that? Guess they're doing every day on these shows. We have to all the time. Oh, how do they do? put that in the notes when we do those notes? Uh, I got it right here. It says, oh, look, right here. See? It's right here. <laughs> no. Speak English, Do you need me extra to sit next to him? Yeah, well, no, no, as a matter of fact, it comes out of our salary. Of another David Beavers, another, another commodities trader at Alaron, you probably know, he says that what's happening with these new figures that come out, which show a little slowing in the economy now, maybe a worrisome beginning of a trend, will eventually put pressure on oil. That the, you know, If you don't have people buying as much oil, you, oil prices have to come down. Yeah, I don't disagree completely. I think oil prices will probably get regulated a little bit. The bottom line, though, this is a global growth story, not just a U.S. story. We have to remember that. There's demand all around the world, and it's not slowing. I think that consumers will be it affected with resets coming in, with mortgages, and now they're getting high heating oil bills. We've got higher gasoline prices. These prices are going to trickle down and hurt the consumer. Bill, I'm glad, hold on, slow. that Kevin brought that up with the heating oil, because heating oil up more than 60% over year over year. Same now, obviously, with, with uh, oil and gasoline very close to that. But at what point do we really see that breaking moment where the consumer markedly slows down and that affects the price going to the downside. You know, I think the reason why, Liz, a lot of people miss because it's a moving target. You know, a lot of people used to say it was $50 a barrel, then 70 then 80 now 100 You know, it's a target that moves along with economic growth. That's mm -hmm. the key thing here. You know, and everybody talks about worldwide economic growth. Well, I'll tell you this. The U.S. is still the biggest oil consumer in the world. If we get into a substantial slowdown in the economy, it will have a trickle effect across the globe for energy demand. Oh. And, and, and we'll see the demand uh, moderate no, a little bit. Yeah, I think no. it will. I, no, I mean, listen, we're... Yes, Yes, Go ahead, Peter. We stop, so, all right, you know, all right. Well, all those goods are making in China. If we stop well, buying them, you no, think they're no. going to be still make no. them? Yeah, they're going to make them and they're going to consume them. Look, oil prices <laughs> rose during the 1970s. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter. We're going to be in a severe recession, but oil prices are going to average well above $100 a barrel next year. Wow. You know, they might move up to 115 or 120 but that's only part of the story. The bigger story is going to be the increase in food prices. Mm -hmm. You're going to see big increases in apparel prices. I think next year, 2008 wow. rather, is going to be a year where we see much bigger increases in the value of Asian currencies, particularly the Chinese yuan. So? And it's going to send these prices through the roof. And yes, American consumers are finished. They're going to have to spend a lot more money on the <laughs> basic necessities of life. They're going to have a lot less left over for other things. They're going, to have, they're going to be spending more money on their adjustable rate mortgage payments. And a lot of Americans, particularly those who work in the service sector, Sector, in retail, in financial services, they're going to be out of jobs. All right. my, so they're not going to have yeah, any money at all, all to spend on these things. First of all, uh, energy is a much smaller percentage of GDP now than it was back in 1980. Because we import all the stuff all we right, used to have. Read my You book. made me forget what I was going to say on the second energy point. And, oh, yeah, look. <laughs> the, you, United States, the United States is a, is a big oil-producing nation. We're like the number fourth largest oil-producing nation in the world. So it's sort of a circular flow that goes on here because if you live down in Houston or these places out west in the Gulf Coast, there's a booming economy there. Even if the national economy goes in recession, these places won't. They're benefiting from this. There's also a lot of petrodollars floating around the world that come back into the United States in the form of investment. Look, we saw the Abu Dhabi investment. We see them buying treasuries and all this other stuff that perhaps keeps interest rates lower than it would have. So there are positive consequences no, but Mike, to the oil. We got to pay Mike's interest. Right, we got to give them eight or nine percent coupons. It's Tom, easy for us to pay four percent interest. Peter, no, nine percent. It's very easy. The one thing that has to get
can factor in here is, yes, energy prices may go up, and yes, mortgage prices may and interest may go up. However, we keep coming up with more productive ways to make things. So the productivity of things like whether we import it or whether we make it here, no, we, we don't. Keep, things cost. Yes, sure we do. They keep, look, I bought a television when I when yeah, I first we didn't make it. in 1983, and it cost me 900 something yes, dollars. Yes, but for we a didn't make that television. And now I, I, I bought out a 50-inch thing for less than that last week. But we didn't make it. We so imported it. We borrowed money to buy it. We should buy so from what? the what lowest cost cares? producer. Okay, hey. we got a hard break, and coming up, corn. Thanks very much. Well, let's take this all to our panel, including Addison Armstrong. He could do a little crowing for us because last week he said that the price of oil was going to go up to 100. Good to see you, Addison. You're right on the money. What happens now? Well, nice to see you and a happy new year. Uh, I couldn't have predicted this was going to happen on the first day of the year. I was a bit shocked by the strength and the ferocity of the move myself. But I think a lot of it is due to uh, new money coming into the market at the start of the new year. Kevin, what about the fact that we've seen a couple of things that all matter to the oil market, such as unrest in Nigeria, a couple of people were killed in protests uh, in the, the near, just the past couple of days. We also have lowest inventory since 2005. So all of those things on a scale of 1 to 10 are each about a 5. But when you put them together... What does it really add as far as a punch to this price? Absolutely. All those factors, you say we add them up and we get this $100 price, maybe even higher. The big thing I'm concerned about is this ongoing refinery capacity problem, which is a big part of that pie. If we see that continue to be low, refinery capacity, that could drive it even higher. That means we don't build enough refineries exactly. and we don't have enough. There's not enough room at the end. They can't make enough oil and, and uh, heating oil and gasoline. We import. I mean, there's refinery capacity outside the United States, and by the way, yes, we, in places we, like Venezuela, we have like built us. No, so that other places uh, in Europe, for example, where they use a lot of uh, diesel fuel, and we get to have their gasoline. Look, we haven't built new refineries, but we've added to existing refineries, and we've increased uh, capacity at, at existing refineries over the last 30 years. The fact is. Uh, year over year, gasoline consumption in the United States ending 2007 did not increase. That's the first time in, in for, forever, basically, that we've uh, you know seen something like that. Okay, and by the way, we're, we, we're putting up a milestone here. If you can look at the bottom figure, the top one is uh, bad enough, but the bottom one, as you can see, it's down below 12,000, below 13,000, just below 13,000. That's sort of one of those bellwether marks that may or may not be significant. It, went, it happened a couple of weeks ago and then came back up, but uh, it is a floor that concerns traders. There, there may not be a bottom to that floor, but we'll be monitoring Tom, it very closely. you would closely. have to believe that the oil price that we saw today touching $100, bringing down the Dow Jones transports 110 points. That's no small chunk of change. Has a lot to do with the sentiment of this market and why this is coming down. Yeah, and look, it's, it's psychological. Look, like, I always say this thing, that, that Wall Street acts like a 14-year-old boy in a Playboy magazine. They see this far in front of them, and your bed is, oh, mate, let's sell, 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 buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. It's just nuts, and they, they overreact to almost do? everything. What should people watching do? Get out of the way. Uh, this, this, Washington? Oh, my God. Please. Okay, this is my message to Washington. Watch people, people, people watching. watching. Oh, people, people watching. watching. Oh. I kind of like the people that are people, 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 people who are watching, chill out. It's okay. Look, the, the, I looked at the price of bread in 1950. It was a nickel. Today it's about, what, three bucks or something? Things go up. Why? Because they use things. And, and right now, the global demand for oil keeps going up and up. Mike, I disagree on this, but if you have an economy, a worldwide economy, that's growing at 6%, oil prices are going to go up. Well, you know what? When the economy is growing really well at that kind of rate, it's good for consumers. In the end, the things we keep buying keep going down in price, except well, for the, the commodities. And Peter Schiff the, the, from the oil, I'm, I don't have a lot of sympathy for oil shakes, but they are taking their currency in U.S. dollars right now, which, for now, are, worse, for now. Worth, which are worth less money uh, oh, than they used to be, quite a bit less. And well, sure, the, the, the dollar is losing value. Look, the dollar is getting crushed today. The yen is up over 2% on a day, huge move. The euro is up one and a quarter percent. The Swiss francs up one and a half percent. Look, it's only a matter of time before the world decides, these Arab nations decide that they're going to decouple, depeg their currencies from the dollar. They're going to trade their oil in euros, uh, in gold. And what, will that mean to, what will that mean for all of us, Peter? Well, that's going to mean that oil prices are going to rise even faster for Americans. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to knock the legs out from under the dollar. And it's going to be much more difficult for Americans to import things Tom that we can't pay no. for. Tom says no. I'm going to tell you why it's not going to happen. Because 
the United States economy is so big that it must increase, as you can almost expect, almost yeah, every year. That's three, exactly four, four, what you said and about real estate last year. what happens is it becomes the year. safest place to put your money. Yeah. That's why no, you're not going to take money in euros or yen or yiki yaks or whatever. They're going to take the money and they're going to come back into no, the United States of America with the safest they're getting killed. in the world. They're getting killed in dollars. The Dow, looked, the Dow got crushed last year. It was down 25% in terms they're of gold. They're not getting killed. It's they're making so much money. They're making so much money that I'm concerned about. No, they're not. Here's my question. They're not. The world is getting killed on their dollar holdings. Mike. Look, it sounds like a broken record every time you say, yes, but the dollar's so weak, and a lot of people don't really understand what that means to them. At some point, this is going to be a serious thing. I sense it, because well, if you have that weak currency, Liz, unlike what we had in the late 90s, which was a very strong currency, people were more buoyant at that point. Liz, your sense is wrong. I hate to tell you. And you what? cannot you cannot be a global reserve currency. Defend me, Peter. Look, the United <laughs> States is the last remaining superpower for two centuries. <laughs> Britain had the currency that was the global reserve currency. When they lost their military dominance, their geopolitical muscle, they lost their reserve currency status. It's not about to happen to the United States. Yes, you know, it is, a, Mike. Wait a it's second, Peter. Right before there's a reason why the Saudis, who are the si swing producers within OPEC, have come out very strongly and said, we are not cutting our link to the dollar because Yet. they understand they're Yet. not going to do it. They're okay, not going to so do it. Okay, so hold on, hold on. Well, Addison, we have given you short shrift, and you were the one who predicted $100 oil, so we're going to go back Plus to you. Me, I what about it. the Saudis? What about the Saudis increasing production to help us out a little bit? Is that going to happen? Well, I don't think so. I think OPEC is going to take a pass this time around. You know, we're looking at a situation going into the first quarter, coming out of the first quarter, particularly where the U.S. economy is going to look really bad. It's going to look like a recession. Is if we're not in one, then it's going to be right in front of us. That's going to have a knock-on effect on the global economy because if we're not buying things, they're not making them. And no. the Saudis and the, and the rest of OPEC are not going to make the same mistake they made in 1998 when they raised production right ahead of a global economic slowdown. I don't think that we're going to get the Saudis. Saudis and OPEC coming to the rescue and putting more oil on the market this time. Well, for those of you who just woke up and are looking at the Dow, which is now down 252 points, oil touched $100 a barrel, gold skyrocketing by $22. Indeed, and all the markets are down today, with the exception of oil and gold. If you're long on oil and gold, you're doing well, but that's about it. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. A new year, a new opportunity to make some money. Isn't that what it's all about? It sure is. And we've asked each person in our Fox panel to pick a hot stock for 2008. They've got to tell if they own it or not. They're here now to talk about it. And full disclosure, all these guys are talking their books, so to speak. That means they own the stocks they are recommending. I don't have a problem with that, Tom, because it means that you're not just saying buy this and you're not putting your money behind yeah, it. Yeah, I've got Exxon, Exxon Mobil, and um, you can't miss. I've been talking about oil all day. It just happens to be there. Uh, it's the demographics are there, the, the, the economics are there, you've got expanding global economy, and it keeps beating the, the Dow. Even if, even if oil goes down to $70, $80? No, 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 look, there's still going to be plenty of profit, and, and profit doesn't always equal what, what the Why is it are. down today? Oh, who cares? Right, right now, everybody's getting hammered today. <laughs> right. So uh, I'm looking long term. Uh, do you look today or you look for the next 12 no, months? No, we I'm don't look months. like the 16 year old boy with the Playboy. <laughs> 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 he was, tell, tell, tell. He bye, was bye, talking bye. of personal experience. <laughs> Mike Norman, what do you have? I wanted, I kind of wanted to get out of the fray here. You know, I understand all the commodity theme and everything. It's been going on for a while. I picked Pfizer. Pfizer, the biggest pharmaceutical Which has been hit company. hard for about hit, three years exactly, now. Exactly. Down a lot, pays almost a 6% dividend. It's the only Dow component up today. Mikey Norman, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, and look, uh, has a huge balance sheet, a lot of cash. I, I, I think we're probably going to see acquisitions, uh, and that should boost the stock price. Kevin Kerr. Mm -hmm. The fray is a cozy place to be. <laughs> the fray, and moving from the drug sector back to the commodities thing, we're looking at Monsanto. Okay. Here's a company that's not going to benefit from higher oil prices, which we'll get to that in a second, but from the agriculture surge. We're seeing soybeans at record highs now, wheat, farming, agriculture is a huge sector. I know the stock is a little expensive. It's around 111 bucks, I think, right now. My feeling is this stock's going to head up to 150 and then split. This is, a, this is a growth stock at this point, which is bizarre, but it's benefiting from the oil price because they're involved with biofuel, which I think is going to pick up, too, from soybeans. They're, they're right. going to win-win. And, again, way. all these guys own the stocks they're talking about. And, Peter yep. Schiff, I, I bet you're going with a spider of, of one of our uh, major indexes, like, uh, no I don't know, Dow Jones or something. Right. Yeah. I, I wonder if Pfizer makes a pill, though, that Mike could take. <laughs> he may, he's going to need something. But, you know, the, the best performing sector in, in 2008 is going 
going to be the precious metal stocks. I mean, they underperformed metal last year. Gold was up about 30 percent, 33 percent. The stocks are only up 20 uh, percent. I've got gold stocks today that are up 10 percent today alone. You like uh, Newmont here. Newmont is one of the ones that I like. It's, it's still about 10 percent off its 52-week high. Uh, you know, it's, it's a liquid stock. It's a big stock. Everybody can buy it. Look, if people don't own any gold or any gold stocks, they got to go in and buy them. You know, when you've got the Dow down 250 points or so on the first trading day of the year and gold breaking out to new highs on heavy, heavy volume, this is telling you something, doting door it. People should sell stocks, sell bonds, sell dollars, and buy gold, buy gold stocks. You can't go wrong with Newmont. Sell Just your, buy it. Sell your house, sell your shoes, yeah. sell your car. But sell whatever you can sell. If you can sell it, what's, it's what's wrong with, what's wrong with that putting, gold bugs are on Prozac? God, that's what it's telling you. so right anxious there. to get it. What's wrong with having a little bit of your, your portfolio in gold? I no, mean, you that's, need a that's, lot that's of your portfolio Okay, I understand you're for a lot, but would you have a little? I don't have any. I do not buy things that have already appreciated Hold tremendously on. in Silver price. Silver just hit a 52-week <laughs> high. That's right. And, and of course, uh, a lot of people feel that those metals continue to go higher because of growth in China. Been going and and for they're, eight they're, years. Free, they're free to go ahead and own those. Uh, it's just not it's my not methodology. Okay. It's not what I do. I'm a long-term value investor. I prefer so to go I. into... Uh, there's a lot of long-term value. I somebody gold. speaking it's in my ear over here. It's just some little fly buzzing around that doesn't seem to go away. Peter, I have a gold tie. I'm going to take it off right now. I'm sending this to you. You should be the one wearing this today, not me, my friend. Hey, can I make friends with Peter here? Yes. I think Peter, I, I, the show's I, short. We, 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 have, we have rarely been on the same side of anything. But I want to tell you something. I think he's not, not, he, I don't think he's wrong here saying that gold is a good thing to, to, to be into here. Look, I think you're looking at a worldwide economy where people are creating more wealth all over the place. And all these countries that used to be socialists and communists and dictators are all becoming free marketers, except for Venezuela. So I think you're, what you're looking at is you're, you're looking at more, more money being made. And these people have, they have, have all this cash in their hand. What do they do with it? What do they do with this yeah, wealth? I, they put it somewhere well, you, safe. I, I agree. And that, that's I, I, gold. I agree with you may have come to the right on, conclusion, Kevin. but Go you ahead, got Kevin. there in the wrong P way. Peter is right. Peter, you're right. See, Peter is right in many <laughs> ways, and you know, for reasons that we haven't even talked about here today. China just announced they're going to start trading gold futures or renminbi back gold futures. Right? This is huge. It's like the ETFs when they came out. It's going to be backed mean, by physical you, you gold. Gold mean like is going up because of inflation. When everybody wanted to own those back in 1998 yeah, and 99 and 2000. Gold here. You think it was kind of like that? I don't, and I don't necessarily agree with the 100% inflation argument. Me either. It's kind of between you two. I'll just bring you together. Can't we all get along? The idea is that it's not the inflation. It's, it's really, it's really people the People watch, picture. by the way, because we can't all uh, get that's along. Right. That's why people are so fascinated by Peter. Uh, I, I bought nice my first Peter. gold stock in 1999. Uh, all right. they, they've just gone straight. Peter goes we out swinging. Break. We've got a break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned with much more of this. <laughs> Just moments to go before the end of a very negative market. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial is down about 227 points today. Have we ever regained 227 points Good to hit question. the flat line? Good question. Probably never. Anyway, this is the first market trading session for the new year. Stocks, as you see, are sinking. Oil and gold soaring to new records, although gold inflation adjusted. It's not exactly a record from back in 1980, but we definitely touched $100 a barrel for oil. And uh, while we closed just a little bit below that, nonetheless, it was a huge day for energy. It was indeed. Well, is this an indication of where the markets are heading for the month and maybe the year? Let's go back to our Fox panel now and begin with Peter. Let's begin with Peter Schiff. Now, I know you are negative on U.S. markets, but is there anything? We saw solar stocks today, for example, partly as a result of oil, partly new technology that they're coming up with. They were soaring today. Is that maybe one place, one place in the U.S. market where Peter Schiff would put his money? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I recommend a new mod Mining. That's what. That's an American yeah, mining yeah, company. True. So I mean, there's there's not that much. Look, the market is in terrible shape. I think there's at least two thousand points of short-term downside risk in the Dow. Uh, you know, there's no reason to ride this down if if you're owning U.S. stocks. But you know, you can't just don't buy bonds. I mean, we're in a big bubble in Treasuries. That might you know, pop in 2008. You can't be in the dollar. It's going down. So you have to get completely out of U.S. asset. That's all you can do. You can buy gold. You can buy commodities. You can buy agricultural commodities. You can buy energy. You can buy foreign currencies, foreign bonds, foreign stocks. There's a whole world of, of places where you can protect your wealth. But you got to get out of U.S. assets. Tom, where do you find the next big thing? <laughs> next big thing? Oh, my God. Well, first of all, I'm not going to take everything I own, dig a hole in my backyard and bury it. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do that. Uh, 
Um, That's not my suggestion. I, I, I happen to think that like, like, I'm an American guy. I like to go American. But, but if you're looking for the next new big thing, uh, you can't go wrong looking at some, at some, of, the, uh, some of the economies that are developing out in, say, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, Vietnam is a good place to go look if you really want to have fun. But, um, uh, well, the, the, they have a stock what market now, and they're, at, they're looking at 10 to 15 percent growth. Not bad. So, which is about, you know, five, three or four times what we're Sounds doing. Sounds like China. Yeah, and what was happening is a lot of the things that, that, that were being done in China are now getting too expensive to do in China, and they're dropping it out to Vietnam. So, I, I, me, I'm looking at the, if, if you're looking to spend that little bit of money and roll, roll the dice a little bit, that's where I'd go, the new, the new, new expanding markets. Kevin, do you have any new, new expanding markets, places that people might not have thought of? Well, I'm going to agree with Peter, first of all, and I want to get to this earlier. I think everybody should have some gold in their portfolio. It's a good hedge against inflation. Gold or uh, silver, which gold you Gold or have. silver, which Liz pointed out. Which is fantastic. You yeah, I own all of it, actually. <laughs> Gold, silver, platinum, all these metals are, are Palladium. solid. Palladium. You know, any of these markets, and I, I agree for some extent with Peter why he's given those reasons, but I, I think we should have some exposure in portfolio. You guys, metals. pander. And no. the bottom line, gold, gold has been very good to me. Uh, there, there's no reason not. Segment. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, like I, uh, right here in the United States, U.S. corporations ne never been better positioned to participate in the global boom. Large capital, large cap U.S. companies, uh, very, very cheap. You know, Liz, your buddy. Um, Warren Buffett, when asked back in the mid-1990s how come he wasn't in techs and dot-coms, he said, look, it's too crazy, I don't want to understand it. And, and he was criticized, you know, sharply for that, and look how it turned out. I think a lot of these people that are rushing into gold now and oil, look, we've had these trends in place for going on seven years. I think it's late in the game. That's not to say we can't see another 5 or 10% yeah. or whatever, but it's Remember late in the game. I'd much rather go into okay. something. Remember, Mike, in 1998, 1999, I was one of the people like Buffett who was pleading right. with my clients Peter, to sell their Peter, in 2002, stock you called me up and said you were shorting the U.S. stock market because you thought the Dow was going no, to 50. Okay, Mike, so, no. I mean, why don't you talk I about that, too? Mike, huh? I've <laughs> never told you I was shorting the U.S. stock market. I'm not short. I told you I was buying gold. No. I was buying oil. I was selling the dollar. I was buying commodities. Commodities. Everything uh, I told you has Tom, been right. Tom, what about Everything. those other opportunities? You know, it's everybody's choice to say, okay, Apple has skyrocketed, but I I'm too nervous. I don't really get it. I'm not going to buy it, although who doesn't get Apple? But uh, as you look at other opportunities, where do, does this credit crunch fit into the picture that we haven't even mentioned today, it's, although it's, we've talked about it It still a lot. has to get worked through. And I think that, that uh, the, 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 uh, the street wisdom is that's going to take another year or so to get to, to work our way through it. I think that's right, um, and I think I think that uh, the Fed has put themselves in a tough position where they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. If, if they if they cut rates, they, they risk inflation. If they if they raise rates to, to curb inflation, they're going to crush the housing market. Which way do they go? And the housing market can pull the whole stock market down with them. So I think look, I, I, I buy real estate. It's a great opportunity to buy right now. And over the next year, oh, your prices no. are fabulous places to buy. But I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a great time to be okay. uh, in any of the credit markets. Got to wrap. Here comes the bell. We'll be right back. Closing bell just minutes away. Stay tuned.